turn it down a little bit. Perfect. Are we live? Yeah. I'm fiddling with the technology. <laughs> well, the technology is good. Hi, Lee. How are you doing this evening? Good, Daryl. How are you? I'm just doing so well. Just get through your 500,000 emails. Not even a little bit close, <laughs> but I really did try. I was just sending a um, client a very interesting, some very interesting correspondence about bats. Bats? About bats. What would somebody use bats for? For pest control. What kind of pests? Mosquitoes, cockroaches, any sort of garden pest. And they're also native endangered wildlife to the United States. So it's good for Thanks. everybody involved. Awesome. Um, so I was just, that was the last email that I fired off before I hopped into this chair to do this little live. That's fantastic. Anybody has questions, they can, of course, Hi. hit us up. We're on TikTok and YouTube I'm, currently. I'm doing my Friday night drinks and dirt kind of conversation. We're going to talk about sustainable landscaping. We're going to talk, talk about yards. We're going to talk about grass. I'm going to answer any questions you have about making your yard more sustainable and fabulous in general. Um, and also behind the camera, we have Lee, who is going to be putting in some native plants in his yard this year. So if, you know, Lee, if you want to chat about that, I'd also be happy to. Okay. Yeah, that'll probably happen at some <laughs> point. So you sent me some questions that are not loading up on my phone, but that's okay. It's okay. So let's see. All right, so today we had a project going where we were building, uh, what, what were we building? I can't remember, I, can, I always call them a hoop garden. A hoop, no. But it's, it's a tunnel. Yeah, it's a cattle panel trellis cattle. that just, so it's a trellis, like an arched trellis that we put on a four by 12 bed. So there's 12, 12 feet long garden beds um, and the, the tunnel's actually covering all 12 feet. So you walk between the garden beds uh, completely under this tunnel. And when the foliage and stuff grows up it, like I have one in my backyard, it's actually right there through that window. Um, and literally in the middle of summer, you have to reach up to harvest a cherry tomato just fully above your head, which is truly glorious and delightful. Yeah. But we're doing a really fun client project um, this year where we're just doing the little garden to start. And then as they put their home extension on the back of the house, we're actually going to triple the size of the garden. So it's sort of just phase one of two. Cool. Um, and imagine that arched tunnel trellis times three, because there will be six beds total once this is all expanded. And we actually launched the video that the garden beds that yeah. were built the arch trellis over yes. were, were built for today. Yes. So if anybody is watching and thinking about building a raised bed and doesn't want to spend a lot of money, Lee sitting behind the camera and me right over here worked on some garden bed content on how to build really amazing cedar raised beds. And that's on YouTube. Okay. Right we, now. we had a question that they can't hear on TikTok. Oh, we can't hear me? No. Well, well it's, I'll, I'm going to hand this to you. <laughs> but it's, it's TikTok. Like it's yeah. my phone. It shouldn't be a volume thing. Okay. Was it just like muted so it wasn't recording? What? I don't know. I don't know anything about muting. I don't Can know anything about TikTok. Can anyone hear me now? They, Can anyone hear me now? They can't hear you. There's no sound. That's the the constant. So what a bummer. Yeah. I'm should I hand this to you? So yeah. You okay. Hey TikTok, you're coming with me. Sorry, everybody watching on the other line. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do some tech support for TikTok while we're doing this. Um, I don't know how to flip a deep flip, flip camera. Hey y'all, we don't know why there's no sound coming on TikTok. That doesn't make any sense. Can you hear me now? Um, other than that, like, why would it be muted? It says mute microphone is off. Hmm. And there's no like volume slider or there's anything 36. on that. Have you tried turning it off and on again? I guess I can turn off live and go on again. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. Can really nobody hear me? What a bummer! All right. I'll try one more time. That's a bummer. Yeah. I have no idea why my microphone wouldn't work on my phone. <gasps> my AirPods were connected. Oh. That's bound to happen. Well, 
for those of you who are watching on YouTube Hi. right now, <laughs> the six of you that are there. Oh God, sorry, I'm it's, so sorry. It's all good. If you have any questions, make sure to drop them in the comment section. And I bet you Daryl will actually be able to answer those even while figuring out what's going on with the TikTok connection. It's like truly, I think I have to restart my phone because I have no idea. Well, I'll just turn off Bluetooth. That's what I'll do. Gosh, okay, yeah. This is such a fun way to start. I haven't even started, <laughs> haven't even started drinking yet. All right, well, we actually did get a question. Okay, great. Yep. So, uh, and we do have some folks actually on uh, our YouTube channel who can hear. So that's okay. the good side. Well, that Last week fun. when we started, we had no volume on YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. yeah. So this is a delightful there. couple of minutes we have going on here. <laughs> Okay, Bluetooth is off, so I'm gonna go live on TikTok again. All right. How fun was that? What a fun like start that was. Okay, there's the live button. You can get that set up whenever you're ready. You have to hit camera flip, I think. That's fine. All right, That's sorry fine. to keep you waiting, YouTube. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so we actually have Rachel. Mm. Sounds familiar. Is less, it, less, it, yeah, it's it's actually uh, it's it's my Rachel. Hi, hi, your Rachel. And uh, she has a couple questions, but she hasn't asked them yet, so she's gonna have to ask them before we can. Okay. Before we can answer them, so. But. I'm watching you with that tripod. I'm nervous. Okay, we got it. And go. You know, We're back. We're back. Technical difficulties. <laughs> my name is Daryl, and I. I'm a sustainable landscape designer and I don't know how to use my phone, but we're back live again. Yeah. Hopefully you can hear me this time because I turned Bluetooth off. So my Air AirPods are no longer connected to the phone. Um, I, I think we're going to be doing good. All right. We're going to jump on there. They're going to be so okay. excited. It's going to be all this excitement. All right. Okay. So we built a trellis um, with cattle panels and it was awesome. And we'll have a video about that later. Yes. Okay. So first question. Okay. We have squash bugs. <laughs> How do we eradicate them or do we have to burn it all down? Um, okay, well, I have a follow-up question that you can answer while I'm first talking about squash bugs, which is what zone are you in? Are you growing your squash right Salt Lake now? Salt But, okay. No squash. Okay. It's my backyard. It's your backyard yeah. about the squash. Okay. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, squash are the worst thing in the whole world. Squash bugs, I mean. Um, there are multiple things you can do. I would say you could take a break from growing squash the following year, and that's going to help uh, bridge the gap between like the squash bug that are currently alive in your garden will either die or leave because they just need a break. So you, you just need to take a year off from growing squash is probably the best answer. Two, you can grow a squash bug resistant squash. Tromboncino squash is my absolute favorite squash to grow because it's massive and it, it yields just the, a massive amount of food and calories, but it's also extremely squash bug resistant. I lost two pumpkin plants last season to squash bugs. I got maybe two little groupings of eggs total on the entire tromboncino plant all season long. Um, tromboncino is incredible. These are the, they're these ridiculous like trom trombone shaped squash that can really be about this large and that's where they get the name. But if you harvest them when they're young, they're, they're, they're like summer squash. You can eat them in place of zucchini. And if you harvest them when they're much, much, like when they're this big, they can take the place of butternut squash. So it's really rope, like versatile, like drought resistant, heat tolerant, squash bug resistant, excellent. The third and final thing, and I, you know, before we had to cancel this live and start a new live, Lee and I were already talking about bats. Mm. Guess what the best thing is to, to get uh, really bad bugs out of your garden? Bats. You also said ducks. And, well, ducks are great for, um, well, there, there's pluses and minuses to ducks in yeah. the garden for integrated pest management. Um, ducks, if you just let them run like free in your actual vegetable garden, you might lose some crops. Whereas the bats don't care about your crops. They just want they just want the bugs. Mm. Um, so bats are re the most versatile integrated pest management thingamabob that I could recommend. And I put <laughs> them in a lot of clients' houses and I actually have, like if, if y'all want recommendations for bat houses and stuff, I got them. And then, um, but ducks are amazing for if you have like pests like in the ground, if you have cockroaches, if you have things like that, because unlike chickens, which are also great for ground pests, 
chickens go into their little house at night and sleep. So any nocturnal pests just, just don't care about chickens and chickens don't care about them. Ducks, semi-nocturnal. So same kind of function as chickens, but they actually will go out into the yard at night, like probably within some sort of pasture, you'll need to kind of rotate them around through your yard and they'll eat the pests. But there are people who worry about the predators that might go after your ducks at night. If, yeah, yeah, so, so there, there are um, like, ro you would rotate them through in little hutches or tractors gotcha. or um, what, what are, just like runs in general to protect them. That's awesome. Okay, question on TikTok. Mm. Invasive European fire ants help. Oh, I hate that for you. <laughs> oh boy. I hate that for you so much. This is going to be a bat podcast, isn't it? Or yep. Live. All about bats. So um, we could have uh, put bat other, in session. Yeah. Other than we don't want to spray, mm -hmm. especially, I mean, if it's right up against the foundation of your house, sometimes you have to do what you got to do to keep them not in your home. But if it's like in your soil, spraying is not the best. The Honestly, I would say you need chickens, ducks, or bats, you need to start thinking about like integrated pest management and bringing in the beneficial animals that are going to take care of, of those ants for you. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about bats a lot today, well, I think. We are actually, because we had somebody on TikTok and somebody on in, on YouTube ask, how do I get bats? Okay, <laughs> we have multiple people asking about bats. Uh, this is wild, I have like promo code for you and everything, and this was not planned. Mm -hmm. I did not, this is not staged, I promise. I think people are getting ready to plant their squash and they're yeah. a little freaked out about but it. The freaking squash bugs, man, you don't want squash bugs. I have a couple TikTok videos up of me fighting squash bugs because I have a irrational fear of them. Mm. Um, and even though like I literally garden for a living and landscape for a living, those bugs make me scream like a little baby. <laughs> Um, I just hate the way they look. I know they're perfectly harmless, but it's wild is because I know they're bad for the garden, like, um, uh, spiders are beneficial. And so even though they're technically like scary, I'm, I see one and I'm like, hello, sir and or madam, they, them spider, I welcome. I shall be over here and I'm not afraid of it, but like, anyway, sorry for the tangent bats. Listen, this is going to sound like this is a like hashtag sponsored. It's not. Well, the, it's, I saw the bats out front when I got here. I think the, the bats did sponsor the, the show today. It's okay. So this is going to sound like I planted this. I didn't. This is just coming up and I have the resources available for you. Um, you need a bat house for the bats to live. Um, there's a company called Bat b, b I really like them because they're made in America. They're sustainable. All the materials are sustainably sourced and or recycled. It, it's, and they make little bat houses and it's, you can put them on your house. Like they're, they look like little mailboxes or you can put them on a little post. And then it kind of resembles like those little free libraries, except it's for bats. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. And um, you basically, they give you like a pheromone mixture that you put in it that tells the bats that they can come live there and then they come live there. And what's wild about that is that they eat tens of thousands of insects per day. They do. So Gracious. for clients who live near bodies of standing water, it is my number one recommendation for mosquito mitigation because you will not have mosquitoes if you have a healthy population of bats. And guess what? Bats are also endangered native wildlife that need our help. So it's like a win, 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 win. And the best part, even if you're a little bit freaked out by the bats, I think they're very cute personally, but even if it's a little bit, mm, guess what? They only come out at night. You'll literally never see them. You'll literally never see them. So another question about bats. Mm, it's going to be the bat. <laughs> We're going bat. The bat pod. <laughs> so uh, do they ever eat the beneficial bugs? No, because, well, no. So they're not going to, well, they're not out with the That's pollinators. That's the problem. Yeah. So that not the problem. That's the solution. Yeah. So yeah, they, they pose no threat to pollinators because the pollinators are hiding at night and the bats are out at night. So they truly just swap shifts as far as beneficial animals in the garden. You have your beneficial, like wasps during the day are incredibly beneficial. And we can talk about that because people think wasps are a-holes. 
um, but it turns, but they are some of your best friends in a garden and or natural landscape. Um, and if you provide them enough to eat and drink, they will leave you alone. And the only reason wasps are bothering you is because they're thirsty and they need, they want some nectar to pollinate. Literally, that's they're the, hangry. They're hangry. <laughs> and they're like, hey, hey, sir and or madam, do you have water for me? And you're like, oh, no, this wasp is trying to kill me. It's just thirsty and you smell like sweat. I, that's that's what it is. Um, so that was another tangent. But what I'm trying to say is you have wasps and bees and all these other beneficials during the day. And then you can have the bats come out at night. You're yeah. The squash bugs, you'll be there. They're going to be very mitigated. Now squash bugs do kind of go down and like try to like kind of sometimes bury themselves in the dirt and stuff at night. So that there might be some give and take with that, but we already talked about squash bug resistant plants and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, man. Um, so again, this is going to sound sponsored and it's not, it's really not, I promise. Um, but batbnb.com did give me a promo code and it's just Yard Farmer Co. So if you want a discount on your Bat BNB, it's Yard Farmer Co. Again, this sounds like we planned it. I did it. I didn't plan it. Another question about bats. Uh -huh. uh, this person... It would be Sawdust Fairy. Had Hi, Sawdust Fairy. Looked into bat houses, but not sure that their HOA would approve of the bat house. Oh, well, it's an ask forgiveness, not permission. It looks like a mailbox. Are you going to put it on the front of your house? Are you going to put it on the back of your house? Um, there's also a lot of literature that you may or may not be able to find for your specific stage about um, how, how HOAs are actually not permitted to uh restrict you from helping endangered critical native wildlife whether that be plants and or animals so even if they were to try to slap some sort of um punishment on you you could likely come back with that literature and say that it, you are within your legal rights to do right by the environment now i personally wouldn't even bother with any of that and i would just put a little back that house in my backyard where the HOA wouldn't know about it because they only come out at night and nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> All right. You ready for a question not about bats? I've got, yeah, we can change okay. the topic. It's All fine. Right. That's fine. Uh, so third M Holmes has mm -hmm. said that uh, in the past, you've mentioned that fake turf is no good. It's no good. But it could possibly, could it possibly have value in a high desert context 5A with limited options for ground cover? No, absolutely not. You have so many options, my friend. Um, by 5A, I'm like, I'm thinking you're in Santa Fe, New Mexico, or like really high up in the Rocky Mountains of some kind. Um, but you've got, you've got, okay, let's think about it. Um, legacy buffalo grass, dwarf carpet of stars. Um, I would honestly, though, I would go for like native, um, like not ornamental grasses, but like the kinds that can be sort of like, like meadow grass, like blue grandma grass or little blue stem or big blue stem. And you can have meadow lawns or meadow ground cover that is extremely drought tolerant and very, very tolerant of like those kinds of conditions where you have the extreme cold and the extreme heat and the high elevation. Um, another great option for you would be uh, this, you could get this book. Native plants for high elevation Western gardens. And there's some really good ground cover recommendations in this book right here. Um, so yeah, absolutely no turf, my friend, unless you want to just put fossil fuels on your lawn and have it smell and be hot and um, inhospitable and terrible. It's my least favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a great short video on that on our YouTube channel. Actually, it's on all of our socials right now. And Third M Homes has confirmed that, yes, they're in your Taos, New Mexico. How did I know? I'm just so good. You're so good. And Taos, I really want to go down there and shoot some of the internal greenhouses they have in the Earthship communities down there, which are kind of amazing. Oh, yeah, I have seen that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm looking this way. I'm just trying to make this not turn off. It's your it's your power saver. Yeah, so. I'm going to do that. And folks, if you are watching and you have questions, just let us know, uh, both people on TikTok and YouTube. There's quite a few people Hi. watching right now. Hello. Okay. Amanda uh, Alcala, Alcala, 675. They're in El Paso, Texas. Hi. I think they're in zone eight. Do you have any grass ground cover recommendations? Yes. Um, El Paso. Um, I honestly, I would look into buffalo grass. If you have super sandy soil, that might 
might be okay. It does prefer more of a clay soil type to a sandy soil type. Um, but um, Legacy is probably my favorite, but there's also a new one. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but if you go to highcountrygardens.com, they have, again, not sponsored, I promise. <laughs> you have, uh, they have like the two types. Um, I believe Legacy is the one that goes down to a colder growing zone, but then there's um, another kind that would probably be better suited to the warmer weather where you are. And it's on that website. I just can't remember the name because you know how they give these varietals of things like cute names. And I just don't remember. What it is. <laughs> yeah. So, and yeah, we had a confirmation from Sawdust Ferry. Their neighbor has uh, the artificial turf around their pool and Ugh. it burns your feet. It more. burns your feet. It burns the poor puppy's Who feet. Who wants that? And then if the, pu if the dog walks on it and then like, if there's any sort of like pet waste and then like imagine like a kid runs on it and scrapes their knee there's like all sorts of health issues associated with it if you really want to be disturbed just google uh the link between artificial turf and cancer and athletes because mm -hmm. the studies are there the studies are there uh cheese garden or cheese's garden said they're a big fan and hope you're doing well and i just want to know uh is a cheese garden sustainable is a cheese garden no that's not their question that's <laughs> I got excited about cheese. I love, well, first of all, I love the, the username Cheese Garden. So thank you for being here. Honestly, it's really, really, that's very nice of you. So thank you for your well wishes. Um, but to, to Lee's question, a cheese garden could absolutely be sustainable <laughs> if the cows are rotated um, appropriately across the ground, like livestock rotation in a sustainable ecosystem would be delightful. It's Cheese's Garden. So that's my <laughs> mistake there. Uh, and yeah, Amanda just confirmed that they do indeed have sandy soil so. okay so you have sandy soil so um honestly i would look at the big so so if you were to google um texas big five grasses there are um like all of the low prairie grasses that are native to texas and they call them the big five and there are certain mixes where if you were not to mow them they would be like meadow grasses but then you could still mow them down to like a three to five inch height to sort of resemble a lawn while still being of ecological significance to your yard and being very very tolerant of your unique climate so and and even if that doesn't end up working for you looking up those big five and then doing um like beautiful perennial borders with those as ornamental grasses is just absolutely gorgeous so I, I would strongly recommend that. Okay. For some of the ground covers that you suggest, would you start them from seed? Um, yes. Yes. For some. So for some, um, almost always buffalo grass and um, there's one buffalo grass. And again, I wish I could remember the name off the top of my head. Oh, that's going to drive me crazy. There two, is two o'clock in the morning. I think you're going to end up going yeah, live yeah, on I'm like, TikTok. Oh, that was the buffalo grass. There is <laughs> one variety of buffalo grass that you can reliably start from seed. It is just escaping my mind right now and I'm live, so I can't Google it. Um, but if you were to even just search like start buffalo grass from seed, that would probably come up. However, most of the time, buffalo grass and dog tough grass and other warm season grasses need to be started from plugs instead of seed. Now, things that can be started from seed, like other ground covers, would be um, like eco lawn blends, which are usually usually mixes of cool season grasses and clovers, sometimes yarrow. And those are very easy to purchase some seed and, and spread that on some soil. And that'll take a couple of weeks to germinate and then a couple of months to kind of fill in and become a useful ground cover. Awesome. An Instagram, an Instagram question. Uh, what do you suggest for garden walkways besides pebbles or mulch? Hmm. Is purslane a good ground cover? It grows like a weed in northern Utah. Yes. Uh, and they also have a follow-up question. They're 100% with you. A, a comment, actually, on ending Roundup use. But what we suggest for weed control along gravel driveways. So that's a question I have, too. Okay. Please don't say hand weeding. Please don't say hand weeding. Okay, so <laughs> let's so ask the first question, and then I'll answer the okay, first question. We'll, get to, we'll do them one at yeah, a time here. Yeah. What would you suggest for garden walkways besides pebbles or mulch? Okay, I actually, funnily enough, I did a video on this on Instagram like a couple of days ago, um, but you want to have a living ground cover wherever possible. So I typically recommend some sort of impermeable, I don't mean like stainless steel impermeable, I, like concrete is impermeable or flagstone in, in the sense that weeds can't grow up through them. Obviously they're still porous. So take that word with a grain of salt, but some sort of, hard stepping stone or paver where weeds cannot permeate and then a living ground cover around it. 
because that's going to suppress the weeds, but also look beautiful and be significantly lower maintenance than say gravel or mulch because weed seeds travel by air and they will land on your gravel or, or your mulch. And then you just have to be ripping weeds out all season long. As is evidenced by, I have some gravel in my yard. I, I know better now. I put it in many years ago. And every single spring, my sunflower volunteers come up because the birds and whatever, like drop the sunflower seeds everywhere. Um, and I keep the ones that I can, but most, sometimes they form hedges in my walkways and I, they, I just have to be ripping the weeds out of the gravel all the time. Mm. Um, so yes, I would strongly recommend stepping stones of some kind or pavers of some kind and then sow a, a clover seed or plant creeping thyme. Uh, creeping sedum is amazing. I believe that that the person who was asking the question said, is purslane a good ground mm -hmm. cover? So the answer is yes and no. The answer is if you already have purslane, and especially if that's kind of in the area where you're going to be doing a walkway, by all means, please use it because she's right. Like it will, it will just proliferate and thrive. And there's absolutely no need for you to fight an uphill battle when it's <laughs> also an extremely nutritional, nutritionally valuable edible plant. So purslin, purslin literally could be used in place of spinach in a salad. Um, and it is more nutritionally valuable than supermarket spinach by a long shot. So if you have purslane growing in your yard, you can absolutely just like leverage those yields, even though it is an extremely aggressively growing thing. Because it grows so aggressively, I don't know if I would strongly recommend you go out and buy some purslane and put it in your ground. I happen to have a couple of purslane plants in pots because again, it's so nutritious that I can just use it like microgreens or put it in salad or whatever. Um, but I would not intentionally plant it in my ground just because I know that it would like take over. Awesome. But, but man, if you have it already, use it, <laughs> use it. And we actually had a comment here that it's so good in salads mm -hmm. and it tastes so good. Okay. Same person. They want, they're 100% with you on ending roundup, but what would you suggest for weed control on a gravel driveway? Mm. Uh, again, they're hoping you're not going to answer with hand weeding. Yeah. Hand weeding is really annoying. Nope. There's two options for you. Besides hand weeding, hand weeding, I suppose, is the third. Um, and I have a clear favorite. The My less favorite of those two is boiling water. Mm -hmm. And that's just a little bit cumbersome and you might burn and you like you splash water on yourself. And that's not great. But it, essentially you dump boiling water on the gravel. But again, just because of the cumbersomeness, I know that's not a word, but you get where I'm going with that. Because of that, it's not my favorite. Not my favorite thing. Um, my favorite thing. I'm not saying this is less dangerous, but my favorite thing is that I just want you to go onto the internet and I want you to type in flame weeder, period, enter, um, and you just burn them. Yeah. And just please be careful not to hurt yourself or hurt others or burn anything down. But if you're just spraying the rock, you should be fine. Uh, but it's really just like a little ch -ch -ch -ch. Yeah, it looks like a metal cup, that, yep. like a flamethrower with a metal cup yep. that just goes over the plant yep. and, and then they, you just and they torch it. Yep. Yeah. Easy peasy. I want one. <laughs> I want, yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if you for people who have large gravel driveways and obviously hand removing gravel to replace it with something that might be a, a slightly better option. It's just that's that's not a better option at that point because mm -hmm. the work to remove the gravel negates the benefits of a better option. Right. So get a flame weeder, go out every three days. Just once a week, if you're feeling fancy. As someone who really likes fire, like myself, yeah. then they have a hobby. Just whenever, yeah, whenever you need <laughs> to feel something. <laughs> whenever you need to feel something, you just be like, babe, oh, I'm taking the flame weeder out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and last question from our Instagram post here. Um, mm -hmm. What would you suggest in place of gravel driveways to prevent weeds? Okay, just... For a driveway, I'm assuming. Yeah, or a pathway. Yeah. yeah. So we already talked about the large format pavers and ground cover in between. That's really, for true hardscape, that's my absolute go-to. Um, when I'm re doing my driveway, which if it works out financially, it might be this year because <laughs> she's tired. Yeah. She's really tired. Um, I'm going to be doing uh, concrete in sort of a Harlequin like diamond pattern with about, you know, one and a half or two inch gaps. And then I'll be sewing a creeping time ground cover in between to sort of have that um, like English cottage look in the driveway. Gotcha. 
Tim Fowers on TikTok wants to know where the best place to buy the native grass seeds in Utah would be. Oh, oh my gosh, you're in Utah. Okay. This is what you got to do, my friend. Okay. This is, and again, not sponsored. I start, I need to start writing these places down and sending them some emails or something. Um, you need to go to Biograss Farms. And by you need to go to them, I actually mean you need to call them because their website's really terrible. Um, but look them up, Biograss Farms. They're on Redwood Road. Give them a call. They have several turf grass mixes that are specifically native to Utah, which is really difficult to find. A lot of times the, the cool season grass seeds and whatnot that I recommend are sort of just like generally well adapted for here, but they're not truly native. Whereas Biograss Farms has native like the prairie grass seed that used to grow in this valley prior to us paving over all of it. And here's the coolest part, my friend. Here is what you need to know. It can be sold as a seed. Biograss Farms sells it as a seed or a sod. So if you wanted a meadow like tomorrow, you could just have them install it as a sod in your yard and you will have a native meadow in your yard. And the best thing about that sod, again, you can never touch it and it would grow to about 12 inches tall and, and it will look pretty meadowy, pretty wild. I have someone who has sort of a side yard where we're doing that just because it's sort of, it's it's okay that it's wild and we're actually sowing additional native wildflower seeds into it. So it's just gonna be meadowy grass and wildflowers. However, if you need it to look and or function more like a traditional lawn, it can be mowed down to three to five inches tall. Oh, cool. And then you just have a lawn that also happens to be native to Utah. And guess what? Oh, that's the magic ticket, isn't it? It's native to here, which means it thrives on our rain. Now, because of, you know, the way the climate is, you might have to water it in July or August because July's and August aren't like old July's and Augusts. Right. But in general, it's completely xeric. And you should absolutely, if you live in Utah and you are going to be putting in sod soon, there is no reason you don't use this sod because Kentucky bluegrass, forget it. Forget it. We don't know her. All right. And uh, Jorge's Hidden Gardens just said, hi, guys. Great info. Enjoying the conversation. Kathy Higgins on TikTok. Hello, everyone from Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi. And Tim says, wow, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Heading over to YouTube. Got a couple questions. Hi. Uh, Rachel wants to plant milkweed, but there's so many types. Which varieties are native in Utah? And can you recommend a local nursery in Salt Lake where you could find some? Yes, Rachel. I absolutely can. And um, for anybody watching, this is your Rachel, right, Lee? Yeah. Okay. Can I direct everybody to my Yoda? <laughs> can you see Yoda? No, I got it. I got it. I got okay. Yoda. Well, I guess his name's Grogu, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to hold him for the rest of the broadcast. <laughs> so this, um, my, my dear friend, Rachel, who is Lee's beautiful wife, Lee is right here behind the camera. Rachel is in front of the camera. She cro crocheted, right? Mm -hmm. crocheted, crocheted this for me. And um, he is my dearest, dearest friend. And I keep him right there on my shelf and he's in the background of every single one of my landscaping consults. And um, so everybody go to um, Rachel's Etsy and Instagram. I believe it's caffeinated underscore otter. Yep. yep. Okay, now I'll answer your question, Rachel. <laughs> um, but just I'm just literally just gonna hold Grogu like this, like a baby. Um, okay. There are two types of milkweed that are technically native in Utah. There's only one type that's truly native to right where we are here in Salt Lake City. Showy milkweed, which is Asclepius speciosa, that is native to here specifically. Now the issue it is not that commonly found to be commercially available. So what you will probably have to do is purchase an Asclepius speciosa start and or seeds from some sort of online retailer. If you were to buy seeds now, it might be a little too late because they typically need to be stratified, which means they need to be out in the cold for an entire winter period. Um, so you could try to find pre-stratified seeds. Sometimes retailers pre-stratify them for you, or you can try to purchase starts where they actually send you the little baby live plants. I know that that can be hit or miss, but it might be worth doing. Um, Asclepius tuberosa butterfly milkweed is one of the most commonly available, commercially available milkweed plants. It is technically native to Utah, but it's actually native to Southern Utah. It would not be bad if you planted it. It does not, it's not terrible to have here, but in general, 
Asclepias speciosa will be more beneficial to native wildlife than Asclepias tuberosa in Utah. However, it is Asclepias tuberosa, if you're watching from anywhere else in the country, is native to most of the United States other than the Pacific Northwest. The Pacific Northwest, Asclepias speciosa is also native as is world, W-H-O-R-L-E-D milkweed, and I do not know the scientific name for that. Um, just a note here, it is really important that you plant milkweed that is native to your region as close as possible. Again, Asclepias tuberosa, butterfly milkweed in Utah, uh, in Northern Utah, it's not the end of the world because we're talking like, you know, a hundred, couple yeah. hundred miles, not thousands of miles. But um, if you do, if you plant something that is truly not native to your region by a lot, by a long distance, what will happen is that those plants will not like grow and die back in the way that they are supposed to grow and die back in their native range because your weather is different. And that will confuse the little baby monarchs and they won't know when it's time to breed and when it's time to migrate and you'll disrupt their breeding and migratory patterns and it's really bad. So don't do that. So just Google what is exactly native to you. And oh, I'm sorry, I hit the microphone. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Google what's native to you and plant that is the moral of the story. That's a perfect moral of the story. Uh, follow up question. Uh, are there any good nurseries for local plants? Because it seems like most of the nurseries in Salt Lake City just carry European stuff. Yeah, it is it is rough out there, fam. It is rough out there. Um, you basically need to go into the nurseries armed with a list of native plants because if you try to just go and ask, the, even the people working there aren't going to know. I, um, I don't mean to knock any Utah businesses here, so I will probably keep the nursery names nameless, but... I went to a very popular, very common one um, here in Salt Lake and asked to see their native selection. And it was one plastic folding table mm. of very tired, very sad looking plants. And it was in the back corner so far away. I did not find it unless I asked about it. Wow. So, and this is like probably one of the more popular nurseries in Salt Lake City. So here are a couple of decent ones, but again, it's not like we have a 100% truly native nursery in Salt Lake City. Um, Deseret Perennial Nursery Farm is on the west side of Salt Lake, kind of out in the industrial area. They at least categorize all of their plants by drought tolerance, heat tolerance, and how well adapted they are to the climate. They do not have anything in their possession that is not adapted to the climate. So at the very least, you're not planting some East Coast plant or, or European plant that requires, you know, 80 inches of rain a year when we get 20 inches of rain a year. It's all like that kind of thing, right? Um, however, I had to go hunting for the natives in that nursery. And these are some ones that you can look out for. So everybody get out your pens and we'll take a list of notes of the native plants that you can look for at that nursery or other nurseries. And this is to Utah specifically, but it applies to a lot of the U.S. Um, Blue grandma grass, little blue stem grass. These are beautiful ornamental grasses. They grow to like two and a half to three feet tall and they look great in rows, fabulous. Uh, Penstemons of any kind, any color. They, they, they come yellow, they come red, they come orange, they come purple. They're gorgeous, beautiful. Um, sometimes people confuse penstemons and hummingbird mint, but they look really similar. They have those beautiful like kind of plumy things. Hummingbirds love them, butterflies love them. Um, asters are one of the most ecologically significant native plants that you can plant in Utah, smooth aster specifically. So plant all the asters. They look like little daisies, little beautiful buttons. We love them so much. Um, sunflowers, believe it or not, um, incredibly important native plant and they're annuals and they're easy and you can just throw, sow some seeds and you will never have to plant sunflowers again because they come back every year, they come back. Um, what else? What else are the other ones to look out for? Oh, yarrow. It, I mean, I feel like you could, you could just jump on, you could just stomp with two feet on yarrow and it's going to be like, whatever. It's like the most easy to grow <laughs> thing here in general. Um, so if I were to just like build a park strip or, or like a little planter of something truly well adapted and native in Utah, I would do little blue stem in the back. I do some yarrow kind of mixed in there in the top because they both kind of get to the same height. Uh, and then I would do penstemons and then I would do aster um, mixed with some little blue stem. No, blue grandma. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah, mixed with some blue grandma in the front because both the asters and the blue grandma are kind of the same height. 
And then I would do some soul dancer daisies in the front because they're these little yellow native flowers that grow to about that tall. Mm -hmm. so, so look for all of those at any of the nurseries you go to. Um, oh, Desert Perennial Nursery Farm, progressive plants in West Jordan, but they are uh, like more of a wholesaler nursery. They're very large, very commercial. Um, I believe... 42nd Street Nursery has some decent stuff, but they, they are definitely more towards like vegetable garden in their offerings. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't believe I forgot this. Um, Growing Empire Nursery on 700 East, one run by an absolute icon named Ruth. She's in her late 70s, if not early 80s. And if you ask her a question, she will know the answer. She has this very soft-spoken, very low voice like this. And she's like, I don't know, maybe you could plant some tick seed coreopsis or something like that. And she, it's just the most wonderful place to go. Sounds like a legend. Yeah. Oh, she's a legend. Okay. Just an icon. All right. And for anybody who's actually watching, uh, if you've missed any of these notes while you're watching on TikTok, you'll want to jump over to the Yard Farmer on YouTube. On YouTube. Because this is also being streamed live there and it will live there in mm. perpetuity. It'll yes. always be there. All right, Titi Andre on TikTok said that their backyard puddles are getting really bad in certain spots and very uneven and bare in some spots. Is there anything we can do about that? I see the puddles? Puddles, backyard puddles. Oh, like water is pooling. Yeah. Okay. Um, that could be for any number, like there's any number of solutions based on the other context of the situation. So it's a little hard to say. Um, if water is pooling near the house, then you absolutely need to sort of alter the topography of your yard a little bit to move the water. Um, and that can just be with a shovel. And, and that, I mean, if, if it's a big yard, you might need to have machinery to do it, but essentially depressing ways for the water to kind of move and elsewhere in the property. If you can do that intentionally enough, and then the water is sort of gathering in one low point, you can plant a rain garden. And then I would just do Utah native riparian species Literally, you could even plant like aspen trees in something like that. But um, Rocky Mountain columbine, silvery lupine, serviceberry, elderberry, like anything that grows up in the mountains and wants something with a high water table, you could let that water move somewhere intentionally and then plant things that like the water. And then it will prevent um, puddling because like all of those plants are drinking it up and loving the water. Um, if that could only be one reason, like there's puddling. So it's hard to say without knowing the full context of the situation. Um, but feel free to add more comments with more specifics and we'll get to you in awesome. a second. Okay, another question on TikTok. Uh, have you ever crossbred your own native herb or wildflower grass? This person's interested in doing that. I have not, but um, I don't know if you're Salt Lake based. It seems like we have a lot of locals in our, lot of local in our comments today. Um, but there is a, a gentleman in Salt Lake called, um, who has a small business called Dryland Horticulture, and he actually um, uh, propagates and and collects Utah native wildflower seeds specifically. So in, as far as supporting a small business and finding stuff truly local and finding um, just resources that are really specific to that, I would definitely recommend him. Again, um, the website is not the best, so you would you would search like dryland particles or Salt Lake City and then get the phone number and give them a call. Awesome. Box on straw for gardening bed cover. Uh, not bad as a mulch, but the biosecurity is really hit or miss with straw. So it's really not my favorite thing. If you have some for one reason or another, great. Um, but if you have to buy it and bring it in one, that's not a, like a closed loop sustainable system. So we can probably come up with something better where stuff that your own yard is producing becomes the mulch. And then two, straw is probably the easiest way to introduce like invasive seeds and other weeds to your garden, because so often um, either there's the actual like grass seed that straw was made from still in there or it's contaminated with far worse invasive species. So the more, most often I see gardens taken over by invasive species is because straw was used as a mulch. So it's really not my favorite in that respect. On a purely molecular capacity, it's great because it's a wonderful, like easy to break down carbon that, you know, 
suppresses weeds, suppresses weeds if it doesn't bring in its own weeds and, you know, allows for moisture retention and breaks down and, and all of the saprophytic fungi and beneficial bacteria love to, to munch on that stuff. But honestly, leaf mold, wood chips, they all do that exact same thing. And there's just a lot less risk for like biosecurity problems in your garden. And there's most likely a free source for wood mulch. In yes. Your, in your town. Yes. So one of my favorite things to do when I'm designing a sustainable yard or a garden is to start thinking about ways to close loops. And one of the most popular ways to close loops is to think about um, how we're going to grow what we will then harvest for mulch. And that could be landscaping mulch in your front yard or, or just in your garden, your landscaping beds, or that could be mulch that you use in your gardens every year, or it could be the carbon that you keep to the side and, and mix with your nitrogen to make compost in your compost pile, all of those things, instead of having to bring in an outside input that is not a sustainable closed loop system. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is to take advantage of any invasive species growing on your property. If you can't get rid of it, why not just be like, that looks like free stuff. <laughs> and you harvest it, you harvest it, make sure that whatever it is doesn't have seeds in it because you don't want to spread that elsewhere. So make sure that it's not something that's like, you know, spreading through rhizomes and you're putting those rhizomes places and then it's not something with seeds and you're putting the seeds places. But if it's just like, like wood biomass from an invasive tree, guess what? You're gonna, you could spend all day, every day fighting those trees or, you know, every once a month, you can take a, a big thing of hedge clippers out, clip all of those saplings and throw them through an electric wood chipper that you can get online. And uh, now you have free mulch. Awesome. We're going to get this question probably every time we do a live stream, and that's fine because I think the answer is yeah. very important. Yeah. But uh, the answer, uh, question is, where to buy buffalo grass plugs and seeds? Awesome. Um, Highcountrygardens.com is a very popular one. That Yeah, I'm just going to say that one. High I, need, gardens. Okay. I need to call them. I need to be <laughs> like, yo, High Country Gardens. You All right. Read. We're going to hop over to YouTube. We've got quite a few people there. We've, we've beat our old view record on YouTube. So that's pretty exciting. That's great. Thanks, YouTube. Jessica is having an issue with field bindweed. Help. Oh. I'm so sorry, Jessica. Is that what we were experiencing earlier yes. today? Yes. Good mm -hmm. morning, Glories. It's yeah. in the same family as the bindweed, and it's my least favorite weed in all of... It's actually not because, it, I mean, at least it looks pretty. It sounds like a jerk. It's just, I mean, it's just, it, it thrives in any soil type. It doesn't need any water. It just is so resilient. And then it puts out these little flowers that literally open during the day to, um, to like absorb the, the energy. And then they close at night to conserve energy. Like these are efficient little efforts. <laughs> They're just <laughs> terrible. Um, that is rough, Jessica, especially if it's a large, if it's a large site, um, Ooh, there are a couple of things that we could do. If it has not gone to seed at all, like, like yet, you could, <laughs> there's, I mean, it's like, even if we create a soil disturbance, you're just creating an environment for the bindweed to like take over. So it really is going to be an uphill battle. I wish that I had just like a snap answer for you. I'd say if I were to direct you specifically, you need to solarize the entire field with clear plastic for eight to 10 weeks um, in order to kill off the bindweed as best as best as possible. But guess what? It's not even going to be entirely enough, unfortunately. Wow. So after you have the clear plastic on the field for as long as you can manage, and this needs to be when it's quite hot out because the whole point is that we're allowing the, um, the ground underneath to get quite hot. I do typically recommend clear plastic versus black plastic because black plastic gets hot enough that it does kill the weeds, but it also kills all of the beneficial microbial activity beneath, whereas clear plastic can kill most of the weeds while still preserving some microbial activity beneath. So that's why I recommend clear plastic. But regardless, you have to solarize, and then you're going to want to put a very intense sheet mulch on top of that solarization. So, I mean, you clear the plastic off, obviously, and then cardboard for days. I mean, you could do multiple layers. If you don't want to collect that much cardboard, you could do contractor paper. But again, if the size of your field is that large, that will become costly because it's like, you know, I think $10 a roll for this stuff and you might need many, many rolls. Regardless, you need something solid down on the field. 
And then you need wood chips on wood chips on wood chips on wood chips on top of that. If you could have five inches of wood chips, I would not be mad. It's going to be a lot of work, but just like have the arborists come and drop dump trucks off of it and, and rake it out. From there, you can, if you want to plant anything perennial, you scooch the wood chips like this, you fill the hole with compost and you plant whatever you want to right into the hole. Um, if you wanted to overseed something, you would need to get like a nice layer of compost or topsoil on top of those wood chips. And now we're talking like a lot of accumulation. So that could be difficult depending on your situation, but that's, that's the only way you've got to solarize and then sheet mulch. And honestly, you're still going to fight some bindweed, but that's your best shot. Oh, wow. That's I'm sorry. Intense. I'm sorry. Oh, we've got another shout out in chat for Ruth at Growing Empire. So that's awesome. Heck yeah. Okay. I love this question. Ryan on YouTube is in SLC mm -hmm. and right. wants to help support a neighbor's beehive with pollinator plants. What are some of the best early season plants that can be planted to support them? That is such a kind that's question. So nice. Yeah. Ryan sounds so like an absolute mensch. And it's, yeah, it's wonderful to think about having full season interest, like for any pollinator whether it be a honeybee, whether it be a, a native bee or, or what have you. So yes, um, this fall, definitely you can go get some bulbs and get some fall planted bulbs so that you have some really early spring flowering. That's going to be um, crocus being the most early, tulips come and daffodils come after that. I love I love a crocus, I really do. It's kind of my, my herald that seasonal depression is over is when I see my first crocus flower, <laughs> um, but as far as native things go, I love a dandelion. I know that they um, have a bad rap, but they are some of the first things to bloom and be available to pollinators in the early spring. Um, and they're honestly just like ecologically pretty wonderful and medicinally pretty wonderful. Um, I'm trying to think of other really early things. Asters are great for fall when everything else has, has closed off. So definitely have some asters to prolong the honeybees pollination as well. What is the other early spring stuff? Oh, you could do like, um, you could grow like edible things. You could grow like peas with the, the blooms on peas would be phenomenal for that. Um, I work for Scythia. We see a lot of Forsythia in parks here, but they, I don't think they're native, are they? No. Not nowhere near. No, yeah. I don't think so. No. Okay. Yeah, we see them in a lot of the parks, but mm -hmm. we realize that they seem a little too um, lush and plump. For. <laughs> yeah, Utah's interesting just because we do have such, like, it, especially historically, I know that this year we have had one of the heaviest snow years in a long time, but early spring is a difficult time for us. I mean, we're seeing, like, trees are just starting to put on buds, right? And it's yeah. almost May. Yeah. So um, don't spray your dandelions because the bees need them at this time. Uh, and yeah, I would, what were the, what was the one we said? I was just talking the about peas. or peas, yeah. And um, there was one more I said, but now I've lost it. It's all right. I already said it earlier. You can find it. Rewind it. <laughs> Rewind it. <laughs> Rewind it. Okay. Hopping over, hopping over to TikTok. How do I discourage grass mixed in with native plants in my yard without hurting the native plants? That is a great question. I guess I don't know what the native plants are. Mm. If the grass is just vibing as a ground cover, I don't necessarily see the problem unless you really don't like the look of it. In which case, you could just sheet mulch around your native plant. So just putting some contractor paper or cardboard selectively at the base of the native plants and then adding some extra wood chips compost mulch to fertilize your native plants. That sounds great. You could also kind of do that sheet mulch and then, and then plant more native ground covers so that those ground covers would compete out the grass. Gotcha. That might take a little while. It might take a little while. That's a good way to go. Yeah. I'm not anti-grass in the sense that, like... A little bit of grass isn't going to hurt anybody. Is if you're not watering a, an acre of, you know, Kentucky bluegrass, a little bit of grass somewhere isn't the end of the world. Uh, Kathy Higgins wants to know if Monarch would take to the milkweed vine that's growing wild in her yard. So I'm not familiar with milkweed vine. I neither am I. Mm. Um, is I would be very interested to know the scientific name. If you could let me know what that is. If it's an Asclepius plant, then then perhaps, but we want to make sure that it's relatively native to here. Awesome. What's the best place to order fine fescues? Um, so many options. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do, America? I'm gonna give you, oh, that's my puppy. I don't know if you can see Zoe, but she's very interested TikTok, in, yeah. in Grogu. Yeah. Uh, you're so sweet. Okay, um, I'm gonna still hold him. 
Mm -hmm. All right, America, I'm going to give you the best place to order fine fescues based on the region that you're in, because I got it all up here. So Pacific Northwest and West Coast, you want to go to Pro Time or PT Lawn Seeds. I think it's ptlawnseeds.com. Uh, for the Midwest, you're going to want to go to Twin City Seed. They're based out of Minnesota. They're fabulous. For kind of Midwest to East Coast, you're going to want to do Prairie Moon Nursery or Prairie Nursery. I think they are separate companies, but they could use some better brand distinguishment because I sometimes think they're the same. Hmm. Um, but all of them have eco lawn blends containing low growing fescues. Creeping red fescue in particular is very beneficial because it's native to here and they don't need to be mowed, which is fabulous. Yeah, we just don't want to be mowing. In the we, of the summer. Why are we mowing? Yeah. We're mowing because of capitalism. <laughs> Should I have said that? Did I sure. open a can of worms? But that's why we're mowing. All right, going back over to YouTube, tips on combating goat heads. Now we know that this is for the third Ed Holmes, third M Holmes and Taos. So goat's heads just everywhere, isn't it? Everywhere. So is this something it's that insane. they just have to cut it or burn it? Or um, I mean, I can never in good conscience just recommend like controlled burning unless you are working with a professional that knows what they're doing. So if that is something that you want to look up, as far as like very ethical and responsible controlled burning, controlled burning does have its roots in indigenous practice. This is, we know that this is a good thing when done correctly, but I cannot tell you to do that without knowing that you are doing that with somebody that really knows what they're doing. So that's one option. Another option is gonna be the same as with the bindweed. We need to solarize and then we need to sheet mulch and then we need to replant with something beneficial that can compete out whatever's left of the goat heads. I'm not sure if you were on for that entire five minute rant I went on, but basically clear plastic, six to eight to 10 weeks of that, remove the plastic, as much cardboard, contractor paper, wood chips as you can manage and compost either in holes where you plant perennials or all over everything where you reseed something new. Gotcha. Okay, do you have any thoughts on or recommendations regarding the, I'm probably gonna say this wrong, the JADAM method of micro cultivation from Korean natural farming? Is that something you're familiar with? I know nothing about what you just said. Okay. I'm not even gonna pretend. Okay. I don't, I mean, I love a lot of things about Korean natural farming. I So I can say the stuff that I know and if, what I'm saying is that thing, then great. Um, I love the way that they use living mulch in their pathways. Like it's very common to see in um, Korean farms, like grass actually growing in between all of the beds because they understand that roots need to be in the ground in order to support mycorrhizal fungi. I love their um, composting methods where they actually ferment the materials. Um, wow. It's, you know, like, like they love fermentation. I love that um, and have actually seen some folks here in Utah using those fermentation methods for compost and it's incredibly effective. Um, and in general, like they really know what they're doing. Yeah. Really know what they're doing. So I'm a huge fan. I just don't know the specific word that you said, but I would be interested to learn more. Do you recommend finally fescue as a no mo option in Utah? Yes and no. Mm. Yes. I do, but if you can get the bio-native version that is the um, mix of perennial ryegrasses and, and things that are truly native to here in Utah, then I would strongly recommend that first. And if you can't get that, then I think find fescues and or buffalo grass, depending on your sun and shade and moisture situation. Um, both of those are fabulous options. I just think the best option is the bio-native Meadow from Biograss Farms for Utah. It's probably my favorite user account name on TikTok so far. Lurker bot account. Lurker bot account. Hi. But but I, I know from this question, this can't be from a bot. If <laughs> it is, it's a very smart bot. How do I smother my cover crop? I've been stomping on it for weeks, but it's still alive. You gotta chop and drop, my friend. Chop and drop. And I feel like that's fairly self-explanatory, but you gotta chop, you gotta drop. And then you could sheet mulch right on top of it. That's actually a great way to um, sort of just just start from fresh. So basically chop everything, drop everything, put a nice layer of cardboard, nice layer of compost, and then you can plant your garden directly into that. You'll just need to cut into the cardboard to get whatever you want to plant right in the ground. And it's just good organic matter, right? So, yeah, it'll break down over time. And because it's still fresh, it will be like a nitrogen-like thing. So once you've, once you've sheet mulched with the cardboard, that's carbon, 
compost on top, that's nitrogen, then get another wood chips layer or something like that on top of that, that's carbon. You, you kind of picking up what I'm putting down. Yeah. Yep, and Third M Home said, yep, that's it. The fermentation is definitely, definitely what they were talking that's about. That's, yep. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. I just didn't know the word for it, but I have <laughs> read about it, it's fabulous. It sounds amazing. Say it ain't Vaux, they have invasive Bermuda grass, it's not dying and it's taking over their garden beds. Is there anything they can do about that? I'm gonna sound like a broken record. Yeah. Yeah. Sheet mulch. Um, it's a <laughs> solar ice. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question if you're still on the live, which is where are you? Because then I can I can suggest what you should plant instead. But while you're answering that, you have to solarize the Bermuda grass and then you have to sheet mulch on top and then we have to get something on top of that. Yeah, follow-up from Sawdust Ferry also on TikTok. They're in a perpetual battle with coastal Bermuda grass. Solarizing with cardboard and wood chips just didn't seem to help. So that's sheet mulching. Yeah. Solarizing is with plastic. Yeah. So it's very different because sheet mulching is just smothering, whereas solarizing is truly like we're burning it alive in there, right? Like we're, we're heating it up to 120, 130, 140 degrees. Um, and that's what's actually like incinerating the roots. Oh, this is a wild question. Oh no. This is a real wild question. Are, we, are you, is it, is it appropriate to ask? Oh yeah, no, no, it's good. It's very, right. very I pertinent am, to I'm this. I'm not concerned. I'm, I'm gonna, be very intrigued by your answer if we have one here. I'm um, what would you do to try to create shade in full sun in Detroit? So I think that would probably go for any dense urban area, wouldn't it? Sure. Yeah. So I'm imagining you're on like a small urban property in Detroit. Um, I would probably say, first of all, look up faster growing native trees and get them in the ground because the best thing you can do for wildlife and for enjoying like a beautiful cool forested feeling is by getting lots of trees in the ground. In the meantime, um, I, honestly, in a lot of my designs, like we'll, we'll design out social spaces and we'll either build pergola structures or when clients are on a budget, we do some cute like things with shade sales. And there's something you can do where you can basically set four by four posts in like large barrel kind of like planters with concrete. And then you can string up like string lights and a shade sail on top. And that can just make it like a pleasant place to sit around and hang out. But that is not necessarily the like eco-friendly sustainable option. That's just a creating a nice place to hang out option. Plant some trees, plant some trees. And you, yeah, just native trees with a medium to fast growth habit. Um, if you're willing to invest in like a two caliper tree that's several years old, you're gonna get that shade a lot faster. But the price on those, you know, you go from being like $35 for a little tree to like $600 for a bigger tree. So you have to do what's best for you. Okay. So we got some uh, clarification from Sawdust Fairy. She had some character limit issues. Uh -huh. She did do the plastic first, but the weeds grew up through the plastic. Oh gosh. So it might've been, she, they're thinking it might've had something to do with the quality of the plastic. Yeah. I would, I would get some, some heavier stuff. There is, um, if, if you're not just going straight to the hardware store to buy fresh plastic, which of course I never feel good about. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get rid of these invasive species, but um, that you can oftentimes go onto Facebook marketplace or um, in general, like just, just the internet and search for like used hoop house plastic. So these, this is the industrial commercial level plastic that they're using on greenhouses with those you know metal frames and then the plastic. And then they replace it every so often and they will either sell or give away the used plastic, which I think is nice as a way to give the plastic one more use before it eventually ends up in a landfill. Gotcha. So clarification on our question about trees in Detroit or cooling down or mm -hmm. shade for Detroit. What trees do you think would grow quickly in full sun? Um, I, okay. What I would say is go to midwestpermaculture.com because I, off the top of my head, don't have like my Midwest trees in my brain right now since I live in Utah. Um, but Midwest permaculture is a great resource for all things sustainable gardening in the Midwest. I'm trying to think of just, I mean, I love, I love the native plums. I love the native service berries. I love, um, I mean, I love pawpaws, which I think you can grow in Detroit. But as far as the fast growing ones, like I'm not positive if honey locust is actually native, but it's a very fast growing tree. I just don't know if it's native to your area. Um, uh, Midwest permaculture, we'll know. <laughs> gotcha. 
Uh, we had a question about whether or not the used billboard vinyl would be a good thing for solar rising. That's fascinating. Is it, is it opaque? Not sure. I think it's just the vinyl that goes over because you have those temporary billboards yeah. and they stretch the vinyl over them and they probably have them for pennies on the dollar you know, if you think about it. Um, I do prefer plastic to be clear. Mm -hmm. However, especially if budget is an issue and especially if like thin, clear plastic didn't work before, I say try it, especially if you have access to it. See how it goes. I say try it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes we find some happy, mm -hmm. uh, happy accidents there. Uh, we had a question about how to get poison hemlock out of their yard. Well, that sounds oh, terrible. That's rough. Yeah, that sucks because there's so many wonderful edible plants that resemble poison hemlock. Oh boy! And if you have poison hemlock, then you have then you cannot try to eat any of those because you're like, yeah, and I don't want that for you. Um, again, it's wow. We really are having a an invasive species little moment here. We on went from bats to bats invasive species. To invasive species. Yep. Um, it's a solarize and sheet mulch for me. That's the answer, especially in things where it's like a brown cover like thing. Um, if it's growing tall, you would chop, drop, or chop, discard, solarize sheet mulch. Awesome. Okay, hopping over to YouTube, question about uh, whether or not Yard Farmer is doing, uh, if you're still doing, a Discord channel. Yes, we are. Thank you for asking. Um, I think everything is ready to go on it. Like it is set up. I think we have beta testers in there right now making sure all of the filters work because we're able to, like you, you, we have reaction roles set up where you can actually move yourself into channels according to your growing zone and whatnot. So if that is, I, I'll have to ask my dear partner in life and business who's downstairs right now, if uh, when that's ready to go. Cause I think it's all built and we're just, we're just making sure with the beta testers that it's ready. Yeah. He's ice packing off a, a install. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, he installed some garden beds and some tunnels today. So he's yep. a little tired. Uh, Ryan on YouTube suggests singing tree arborists in Detroit uh, oh, yeah. as, as a good local service for people See? who, Wait, so someone on YouTube is giving suggestions to someone on TikTok? I know. I thought they were always natural enemies. We heard they were getting together and <laughs> we got it out. Someone coming out of the computer giving advice to you in the phone. Yeah. Um, so what was it, Lee? The company is Singing Tree Arborists in Detroit. There you go. That's how great. beautiful. People I love helping that. People. Yeah, people helping people. <laughs> okay, question about false strawberries. This person has false strawberries and wants to know what they can do to remove them from their yard. Is this I, solarizing a sheet mulch again? So, it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm that sorry thing. that the answer is so redundant. Yeah, it would be solarizing and sheet mulch if you really don't like them. I'm trying to think about if false strawberries are all that bad to have as a ground cover. If they're really aggressively competing out stuff that you know is beneficial and good, then yes, it's a solarizing a sheet mulch mm -hmm. for me. Okay, another question on TikTok. Uh, this person is struggling with thistles that refuse to be gone. Is this going to be the same one? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a good, it's a good answer. If you're having wide scale weed issues where the weeds are also ground cover, like if you have pastures of, of weeds or a lawn, a lawn full of weeds, it's a solarized and a sheet mulch is the primary way to handle truly invasive weed species. Um, if they are just in your existing beds, that's where it gets tricky because you have to decide if you want to sacrifice what's growing there or not. If you have stuff growing there already, you are going to want to sheet mulch on sheet mulch on sheet mulch around the stuff that you like directly on top of the stuff that you don't like. But this is not a one and done because you didn't solarize it means that it's not actually really all that weak or dead down there. So you've got to, you've got to sheet mulch and then two weeks later, sheet mulch again, and then two weeks later, sheet mulch again. And maybe after a season of doing that, they will be, um, they, you know, they would not have been able to photosynthesize enough to keep, stay strong. And then you can plant ground cover that will eventually compete them out. But you need to weaken them enough before you plant the ground cover so that those little baby ground covers have a chance. In their case, they're struggling with the thistle because it's, it's popping up all over their lawn. I solarize it and start over. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Does moss fall under the weed category? No. Okay. No. If you have moss that grows on its own and you don't hate what it looks like, you better keep that because that is a carbon negative product that absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere like nothing else does in the world. So proliferate that. Enjoy that. 
I live in a place where moss, sometimes we, I might find it in the most like shady little back corner, but in general, we can't have moss lawns here. We can't have any of that, that like beautiful fairy tale forest moment in this very hot, dry place. So if you live somewhere where you can't, you best be doing that. You can always you tell, best be doing that. You can always tell people from the high desert area when they hit the Pacific Northwest because they just stand on bridges and by trees going, what, what is all that green no. stuff? No, it's so true because <laughs> when we went to Oregon um, this past, what was it, February, and we were hanging out with all of our friends who had moved from Utah to Oregon, the number one thing they said was, I just would like see moss on a sidewalk and just stare at it. <laughs> What is this alien substance yep. growing across the concrete? It's slippery and wet. That's yeah, what it is. yeah. Be yeah. careful. Um, no, don't get rid of moss unless it's like a safety hazard, like we said. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a person come in late, and their question is, and we'll be doing a video on this shortly in depth, talking about solarizing. But we've been talking about solarizing, but uh, the explanation was very early on in the, yes. in the live stream. So is, are they asking? They're asking what, what solarizing it is. is. Yeah. All right, real quick for anybody who. Um, is joining us late. Solarizing a field, a lawn, a garden bed, whatever, is the act of putting down a clear plastic during hot weather. So typically in the Northern Hemisphere, you would put it down in about June. You would leave it on for as long as you can stand it. It's really ugly. So, you know, sometimes we just get impatient. We want to rip that off. As long as you can stand that until the fall when you can plant something beneficial in its place after the sun has gone through there and greenhoused underneath there and basically incinerated all of the invasive species roots underneath. Um, in the case of truly, truly invasive things, solarizing is not enough. You have to solarize and then you have to heavily sheet mulch and then you have to plant something that will compete out what you have, are trying to eradicate. So it's a, it's a multi-step process, but I'll be here if you need a shoulder to cry on. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it in the long it's run. It's worth it in the long run. All right, for all of our folks following us along here on TikTok, just wanna let you know that if you've missed any part of this live stream, we have this living forever on our YouTube channel. And if you wanna pop over there, like and subscribe, if you feel we've earned it, we will love you forever. Smash that like button, smash <laughs> that subscribe button. Yep. Do it for baby Yoda. All right, this is a fun one. This is over on YouTube. Okay, if, if it's about solarizing, yeah. I think we need to just respectfully refer them to the YouTube now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, this person feels like they know the answer is probably solarizing. <laughs> but, um, and, but I think this is interesting because I see a lot of people talking about this particular invasive plant that everybody's very excited about when it first shows up. And then a year later, that's all they have. And that's mint. Is mint yeah. a bad thing? Is it... Um, especially if it showed up on its own, girl, run. I don't even know, <laughs> I don't even know the gender. And, uh, like, to me, I'm using girl in that context yeah. as a genderless, like a girl, run. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if you planted it yourself, I mean, also kind of run. I definitely recommend planting mint in pots because it does, it's very aggressive and it can take over. Um, don't necessarily solarize mint because, so this is funny that this is actually, the answer is not solarizing. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Don't necessarily solarize mint because guess what? It's an edible yield. And so um, in, in permaculture, we want to think about sort of like harm reduction and we want to think about like the benefit of the work and like what is worth doing, right? Um, sometimes when you're fighting an invasive species, it's an uphill battle that is not worth fighting if there are other yields and you can manage those invasive species responsibly and effectively and garner other yields from them mint being one of them. So what I would want you to do if you have a abundance of mint is to not be shy about harvesting it and preserving it and using it in literally everything. So I'm saying dehydrate it, make teas for make tea bags for everyone you know or loose leaf teas in mason jars for everyone you know. Um, make uh, like bath bomb products out of it, like make salves out of it. Mint juleps. Make cocktails <laughs> out of it. Um, make, yeah, like with a lot, with when I have an abundance of herbs, I make an herbal simple syrup with those herbs. And, and mint would be one such thing. I use it, I do that a lot for basil at the end of the season, rosemary, thyme. I make an herbal simple syrup and then I pour that simple syrup into ice cube trays, silicone ice cube trays, and then store them in my freezer. And then anytime I want a little drinky drink, a little cocktail throughout the entire winter, 
I can take one of those simple syrup ice cubes and put it in a cocktail shaker with literally any liquor of choice. It could be vodka, it could be gin, it could be whiskey, it could be whatever. And you shake that up and the ice cube is currently the ice cube as well as like the flavoring for the drink and then you're done. So, so what I'm saying is use all of that mint. Do not let the mint use you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have a symbiotic and not a yes. one-way relationship. Yes. So the concern, uh, Rachel typed in here on YouTube that the bees seem to love it, but she's feeling bad because her mint is spreading into the neighbor's yard. Yes. Harvest everything that is even remotely close to your neighbor's yard. You can leave. Again, there's an edible yield here. Mm -hmm. Same when we were talking about using the biomass for mulch. Yeah. Like um, I had some, some people on TikTok asking me about Japanese knotweed the other day. Um, which has dual yield purposes while also being one of the most impossible to eradicate invasive plants that I've ever come across. It is truly terrible if you have it. However, it is in the rhubarb family and can be used like in place of like a strawberry rhubarb pie. So you can harvest it like an edible yield in that way. It also, when um, it uh, goes dormant, the canes that are left are like a one-to-one -one for bamboo. So you can like use that for making fences or you can mulch it for your compost. You can coppice all of it and throw, put it through a wood chipper and use it as, as wood chips. But it's really about deciding like if you cannot get rid of the invasive plant, how do you keep it from spreading while also benefiting from it in some way? And before I go talk about that too much, I do have a book on that. I'm sorry, I'm turned around. Oh my gosh. Ah, this is a really good book on that. Beyond the War on Invasive Species, a Permaculture Approach to Ecosystem Restoration. Because guess what, guys? A lot, the word invasive species is a really emotionally charged term that um, was made emotionally charged by Monsanto. Yeah. And they actually, Monsanto got million, 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 million dollar contracts with like the U.S. government to spray Roundup on um, he, like ecosystems on all of our wetlands and everything in order to in, eradicate invasive species uh, in order to make millions, if not billions of dollars. And yes, like we don't want invasive species infiltrating our ecosystems, but we also need to start thinking about our management of those in a more nuanced way beyond like invasive bad spray chemical, because that's what Monsanto wants and yeah. we don't like them. Uh, suggestions we've had also added on for mint. We've had mojitos suggested, mojitos. which are fantastic. And then Sawdust Fairy on TikTok said a great idea to add mint to iced tea or lemonade. And uh, they couldn't grow enough of it to sustain that. But I know of a particular yard, mine, mm -hmm. has enough mint in it that I could probably just open a, a mint lemonade stand. And That's what I'm saying. I've got my retirement plan. Yeah, you're going to own a mint <laughs> lemonade stand. And I will frequent it, my friend. Awesome. I will frequent it. No, yeah, I would say start going at it, but like benefit from it. Right. I mean, think about the loose leaf teas you could make with all of that mint. You could have, you could have. So, you know, people with ulcers or stomach, oh, for stomach mm -hmm. problems, mint is really good mm -hmm. for that. Okay, uh, the person who asked about moss earlier has given us some clarification. Their yard, we know already since they have moss that they're in a pretty humid climate. Um, part of their yard has moss mixed with grass. Is there a way to discourage the grass and encourage the moss? Yes. So you can plant more moss. So you can actually find moss native to your region at like sometimes local nurseries or sometimes online. It's worth Googling. Um, and you can also take some of the existing moss that you have and you can make a slurry out of it. And essentially you take the moss and you put it in like a spray bottle with water and you shake it and you shake it and you shake it and you shake it. And then you um, spray that everywhere and that will allow more moss to moss the moss will moss the moss will moss the moss be mossin most moss for moss hey hey lee yeah can i ask you a question yeah what what happened that made you like have a little conniption over there oh this next question oh okay. it made me laugh i love it it's my okay. favorite question of the night uh, like 15 seconds ago lee I, in the background was like oh i was laughing this is a great one <laughs> all right <laughs> Favorite, I just because uh, you know, growing up in the Salt Lake punk scene, uh, knowing a lot of people that were of the goth persuasion, favorite goth garden ground cover for the Midwest. Uh, oh my gosh, uh, I love this question. I have a whole video on goth gardens. What? Um, yeah, Carol. No, I, I do. What haven't you done? Um, I have a whole video on goth gardens. No, oh, 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 oh. My phone is literally over there doing the live, but I literally have the pictures. Um, foam flower is gothy as heck it's not actually black they're little white flowers 
but it has this um it has this like very ethereal quality and so really what i'm going to say is instead of just thinking of the ground cover as needing to be goth we need to start creating goth emotion in your yard and so what we want to start thinking about are like native viburnums red twig dogwood black lace elderberry and then you can do selectively some non-natives in containers black mondo grass just don't plant that in the ground because it's not native it's it's i believe native to japan but black mondo grass is the gothiest thing to ever have been made <laughs> and then um uh oh what was the other one just those those uh, purple, like black and purple um, irises and tulips and whatnot. Again, like in containers in the ground, tulips are not particularly invasive, so you can put them in the ground even if they're not native. Um, but really the, the key is to create shade and to create the moodiness so that you may or may not be walking among the grounds of a Gothic castle. And um, foam flower, and then there are a couple of other ones that the, the, the names of them are escaping my, my little head right now. But if you actually go to my TikTok or Instagram, I have a video on golf gardens. I have two actually, where we talk all about that. I think we're gonna have to expand on that. Yeah, yeah so Rachel on YouTube said that her black lace elder flowers are hella goth. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so elderberry is a native to the US uh, plant. Black lace elderberry is a cultivar of native elderberry. So while slightly less, like natively beneficial, it's still like really great and adapted here. And it's literally dark purple with lacy flowers. I mean, come on. They're very cool. It's as gothy as you can get. <laughs> okay, we're looking for reputable sources for red clover and micro clover. They're having a very hard time finding anything in 7B Atlanta. Oh, fascinating. Um, I would look at Prairie Moon Nursery for sure or Prairie Nursery online. Um, and just get an eco blend of clovers. What I will say is micro clover is a scam. Mm. And um, I feel like now is a great time for me to rant about how micro clover is a scam. So essentially, um, white clover, Dutch clover is trifolium repens is the scientific name. Micro clover is trifolium, repe trifolium repens X pirouette. So Dutch clover, trifolium repens. Micro clover, trifolium, trif wow, I'm trying to say this all incoherently, is trifolium repens ex pirouette. Um, it is about a half an inch shorter than Dutch clover. It is like 10 times the cost of Dutch clover. So it is marketing. They're trying to tell you that it is better suited as like a lawn and a ground cover, but it's just fancy, funny marketing. The one thing I will strongly say with that is make sure that when you're ordering clover as a ground cover, that it is actually white clover or Dutch clover, because any clover that's meant for animal forage, like red clover or, or whatnot, is um, going to grow to two feet tall. And you're going to be very confused about why your clover lawn is now a clover prairie. So be careful. Be safe out there. <laughs> How do you put yard waste, such as dead clippings, back into use in your garden? Uh, com composting is a great one. Um, and also just like live mulching. So you can chop and drop depending on where you're putting it. Um, in So did they say like grass clipping specifically or what did they say? I uh, said yard waste. Yard waste. Yeah. So I will do a, a number of things. Number one, I have a little electric wood chipper from Sunja. So if it's like woody shrubs, like those kinds of clippings, I will immediately mulch them. And then I will either place them just directly back on the ground, right underneath what I've mulched. In the case of fruit trees, this is actually especially important because that's how trees nourish themselves in nature is actually with their own biomass. So if we clear away all of the biomass, we're actually robbing them of like very naturally occurring, easily bioavailable nutrients. So definitely do that. If you have more left over, I like to have a, a bucket, like a bin set aside near my compost bin that I just call like my carbon bin, because it's, you know, if you've ever had smelly compost, that means you don't have enough carbon in your compost. But what happens is like we go and we put our banana peel in the compost and then we don't want to go hunting for like a pile of leaves or a bunch of wood chips. And so then we just decided it'll probably be fine, but it won't be. So I just have a big bin of, of carbon. And then anytime I dump my coffee grounds in my compost, I can just go and grab like a huge scoop of the, the carbon, dump that in. Now we have equal parts and we'll have delicious, beautiful soil later. So 
always any biomass that you're harvesting, as long as it's healthy, as long as there are no pests or fungal issues or anything like that, it is free mulch or free dirt or kind of both because the mulch will become dirt eventually. A question from Kathy in Ohio. She wants to know if her garden can benefit from Florida ocean sand that a friend brought back. I do not know why. Okay. No, I do not think so. Um, I see no reason <laughs> why you would want to do that. <laughs> uh, Kendra says, Daryl, hey, went hey. to HSMC with you back in the day. Hi, Kendra. <laughs> no way, really? Yeah. I didn't make it up. Hey, I, don't know. I don't know Kendra. <laughs> Kendra, my friend from high school, is in my TikTok live. That's awesome. That's so cool. That's HSMC awesome. is the high school at Moore Park College, by the way. That's what that was. Uh, our person asking about microclovers are excited to know that uh, that you had that helpful information. Oh, you're so welcome. They're a big fan there. Yeah, thank you. So this person also on TikTok wants to know, they, do clo they want to do clover for their front yard, but they're worried about it taking over their neighbor's yard as well. Um. If you live in a place where clover is super aggressive, then yes, I would say maybe be, let's be careful and choose a less aggressive thing in your yard. It really depends where you are. And if you want, you can let me know where you are. And then, you know, after I've answered somewhat of your question, we can jump back in with that. But it, where I live in, in Utah, clover is just not that aggressive because it's so hot and so dry here that it's just very rare that clover will actually take over. In fact, that's why I typically discourage people from doing primarily clover lawns because it's just not actually as resilient as they think it's going to be. In, in Utah, I really strongly recommend you do a mix of yarrow, grass, and clover together. Um, if you live somewhere else, like maybe the East Coast or somewhere where clover is literally everywhere, then I would try to be considerate about your neighbor in what you plant and maybe um, look for like a, like a fescue grass or something that's just going to be significantly less um, aggressive. Now, the only way that you can try to mitigate spread into another yard would be, you would need to dig a trench and put a barrier in the trench in order to prevent any rhizomes or anything. But if you allow clover to flower, then seeds will also contribute to its spread. So it's really up to your discretion to decide if that's worth it or not. Clover can be a great plant, but be considerate. We get this question almost every live. And it's actually a question I love anyway. So I'm always going to ask it. Uh, favorite books on your bookshelf there? Um, well, we have two right here on my, on my, that I've already referenced over the course of this mm -hmm. live. Beyond the War of Invasive Species. Beyond the War on Invasive Beyond the War on Invasive Species, a <laughs> Permaculture Guide to Ecosystem Restoration or some such. Um, really, really cool, especially if you're dealing with invasive species on your property. It's just going to kind of flip your perspective on what makes an invasive and how to manage it and how to be a responsible land steward. Strongly recommend that. Um, I already had this one pulled off because we were talking to someone in Taos, New Mexico, but Native Plants for High Elevation Western Gardens is just like just an encyclopedia for me. I use it all the time. Even living here in Salt Lake City, Utah, there's a lot of crossover. Um, planting in a post-wild world is probably my favorite um, like coffee table book. So if you just want something really beautiful to have on your coffee table to like have someone kind of peek through and, and be like, look at all of the beautiful flowers. This is about landscaping in a way that goes beyond just like a bunch of petunias in a row, right? So we're talking about like leveraging native species to create like interesting and wild landscapes. And there are a ton of really cool examples on here um, from like stuff like this, where you're actually just like mimicking woodland ecosystems. Um, here's like a fun like hill where they're doing, this might actually be the High Line in New York City. I think it might be, I can't tell right now, but um, they're like stabilizing a hill here from erosion um, just by like native, uh, mimicking a native meadow, stuff like that. Um, I strongly recommend that. Um, if you like mushrooms, Mycelium Running is a really fun book by Paul Stamets. Um, and there's some really cool stuff on remediating toxic um, materials, leads, heavy metals, petroleum products using fungi. Very, very cool. Same with all of these teaming books. In fact, I probably have to move these to the top of the list. If you want to just be a better gardener, if you want to just plant things smarter, better, happier, you need to read. Teeming with microbes, teeming with nutrients, and teeming with fungi. They are three books. They are companions. You can read them in whatever order you want. 
I think teaming with microbes is actually technically the first one, but it, I read teaming with fungi first. It doesn't matter. Uh, it will change the way you think about the way you garden because you start realizing that you're actually farming and gardening the soil before you're farming and gardening the plants. Very important, very beautiful. And Paul Stamets is such a badass that they actually named a character in Star Trek after him. Wait, which one? Paul Stamets on Star Trek Discovery. He's the guy that operates the mycelial network that they travel through to go from one point of space to another. I I have never seen that. But it's pretty I cool. Need to, <laughs> I need to see that. Wait, now you want to talk about a geek show, the Art Farmer crossover. Yeah, we'll, we'll introduce you to about, Discovery. And, wait, Lee, let's, yeah. let's do a live stream about, I'm not joking, Lee. Yeah. Let's do a live stream about like... Um, geek stuff that crosses over. Yeah, well, eco, um, I'm trying to think of the word like cult, the eco-friendliness or just like, like eco-mindedness in pop culture. Yeah. Like we could talk about, I could talk about the, um, the spores in Last of Us for like days and yep. days, right? Um, let's do that. Pop let's culture that. meets like eco we'll up talking about Paul Samuels like, a lot. Like, <laughs> like all of the um, parables and like dystopian eco-fascism we see in pop mm -hmm. culture and like all of that would well, be- All of the Lord of the Rings were an anti-industrialist parable let's, that let's, Tolkien hated coming back from World War I and seeing all the factories where the fields used to be. And that's that's literally what Mordor was about, was hating the foundries and everything else. So, yep, we're gonna have to do that. Hey, if you're watching this and you want to listen to two very nerdy people talking about all of the references to like eco-mindedness in pop culture and a history of that, hit all of the buttons right now to tell us that we should do that. Uh, my my youngest kid has just chimed in to say, um, yeah. cough, cough, nerd. <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting roasted on the live yeah. stream by your own child. Always get roasted. <laughs> but thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting us. It's yeah. so nice. You have a fan club, Lee. Uh, do you think, okay, so going back to Clover, do you think Clover Lawn in New Jersey is a good idea? Uh, this person read that in winter, the lawn gets, the clover gets brown. It will, yeah. Um, but it comes back with it, a vengeance. It'll come back. Um, and in New Jersey, you'll have a, quite a bit of snow, um, not, obviously not accumulation like we have here or whatnot. Um, in, in New Jersey, honestly, a cool season eco lawn blend is gonna be more resilient than clover in general. There's gonna be a better ratio of grass to clover. Um, so you'll have a little bit less of that aggressiveness. So I would, yeah, I'd strongly recommend head over to like Prairie Moon Nursery or Prairie Nursery, get an eco lawn, low grow, low maintenance blend with grass and clover. That'll be better than doing clover entirely. It, it's just going to like exist better in your natural environment better. Yeah, like you were saying on our last week's live, that clover on its own is it's kind of delicate, it's fragile. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't necessarily hold up as well for this kind of stuff. Yeah, grass really helps. And we have academic studies where we know that grass does better when it's planted with clover, and clover does better when it's planted with grass. These are meant to be planted together. Yep, they're good, they're good pals. They're just a couple of buds. Alexandra lives in Boise, Idaho, and is watching us on YouTube. They've heard that raised beds are not such a great idea in a place that gets as hot and dry as Boise does. What's your take on that? Oh, that is a really interesting and fabulous question. So, yes, to I think the point to which you are speaking is that um in general, being planted directly in the ground, specifically in places like Utah and Idaho, where we have clay soils, you are going to get significant more insulation from the heat and fewer temperature fluctuations. There are a couple of caveats though, because planting directly in the ground requires quite a bit of preparation and it can be really, really difficult for some people. So raised beds definitely present a more accessible entry point into gardening. So if you truly just can't wrap your head around like how you would need to prep ground, especially if you have rocky soil or really compacted soil or clay soil or really sandy soil or anything like that. If you can't wrap your head around how to just plant right in the ground, you can still do a raised bed. What you're going to want to do is, is a very thick mulch on top. So you'll, you'll plant into your topsoil, raised bed soil, compost, whatever you have on the top. And then we're talking three solid inches of organic matter as mulch that is going to help you help that soil regulate in temperature, conserve the moisture in the summer. Also keep it warmer longer so you'll have a longer season up there in Boise. Uh, yard farmer client Aaron on YouTube says that, uh, of course, you're- This is Aaron Moore at yep. Daybreak, Utah. Are there varieties of roses that aren't okay to plant? Just fall in love with the James Galway climbing rose. You can absolutely, we are so going to plant the James Galway climbing rose <laughs> for you. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. 
Um, hi, Aaron. I'm so excited. Um, the, honestly, no, roses do really well here. They're really hardy. They're drought tolerant. They, you can, you can basically just run over them with a mower and they're going to come back. Um, they like Utah clay soil. They, you, they would benefit from some seasonal fertilization. And obviously you need to care for them as you care for roses, but I know that you love roses and I know you love to care for roses. Um, we are going to plant that rose. My other favorite resource for, for roses is David Austin roses. They've just created some of the most beautiful classical, like English garden style roses in the world. Um, and that's what I have growing up my um, arbor as the entrance to my garden. Hi, I'm so happy you're here. I, somebody I love you. Confirm, they mowed their roses and they came right back. They came <laughs> right back. Uh, Aaron also wants to know if it's okay to get compost from the dump. If you live here in Salt Lake City, Utah, you'll actually see a giant sign when you're taking your yeah. your stuff to the dump saying the compost is like, yeah. it's hella cheap. Yeah. And is it okay to get that compost from there or do they need to be more careful? Right? Um, so it, it's going to vary city to city. So I don't want to give away blanket advice. However, in general, yes, it is absolutely okay. Um, but do double check with the city that they have specifically stated that they are following all of the necessary precautions and standards. Um, Salt Lake City specifically, I know you're not out in Salt, you're in Daybreak, um, but Salt Lake City specifically very clearly has a stamp that they're saying we are following the ne necessary standards to make sure that this compost is appropriately broken down. It's been heated to the appropriate temperatures. It reached the appropriate temperatures during the composting process, and therefore you would not be introducing weed seeds or invasive species into your yard. I cannot stress this enough. Do not reply to a Facebook marketplace ad saying free compost. I'll drop it off at your house because you know what that is nine times out of 10. Tree That's heaven. somebody who owns. No, it's no, 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 no. Um, you could get tree of heaven. If you apply for a chip drop and you don't specify that you don't want tree of heaven, gotcha. because guess what? People take down a lot in Salt Lake trees mm -hmm. of heaven. So write down no tree of heaven when you apply for your chip drop. But if you see a Facebook marketplace ad or a Craigslist ad or a KSL ad that says, Hey, I'll drop off free compost to you. What that is, is a dude who owns a horse <laughs> and he wants to get rid of the stuff at the bottom of his stall. And he is raking that out and doing nothing to it and giving you uncomposted wood shavings with some horse manure in it. In Utah specifically, that is essentially useless because um, one, way too much carbon to actually be beneficial. It's going to tie up all of the nitrogen in your soil for years and years and years and years and years. And then two, the manure, because it hasn't composted yet, is so high in phosphorus. Guess what we already have too much of in Salt Lake? Phosphorus. So please, 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 please make sure that your compost is actually compost. And I'm sorry if the client I have, who I'm speaking from experience with, is watching this. <laughs> because she knows who she is. <laughs> <laughs> We've had quite a few people say they definitely want this, uh, this nerd landscaping podcast to happen so we'll make it we'll Lee make it happen and sure. i are gonna live stream and or podcast about <laughs> pop culture and eco fascism and other things that happen in pop culture about oh, maybe we can talk about solar punk that's what yeah we should talk about solar punk and pop Lee, this could be a whole podcast uh, it doesn't yeah, even need to be a, it could be a whole podcast uh, um there's so many so many things in pop culture and dystopian stories and like you said was it star wars or star trek star trek star trek if, if anybody watching doesn't know, Lee himself is on a very successful podcast called Geek Show, and you should check it out. They also have a cool YouTube channel, so Wait. clickety clack on over there. <laughs> we have a question from Kathy, and thank you, Kathy. Kathy's been with us all night Kathy, on TikTok. You're, Kathy, you're a real one. You're a real one. Uh, how would you go about keeping mosquitoes out of the garden? Can't hang out in that garden because they're getting them so bad. What do you think I'm going to say, Lee? I'm going to say bats. It's going to be bats! <laughs> Um, Kathy, since you've been on, <laughs> I don't want to sound salesy, so I'm trying not to sound super salesy. Kathy, yes. you need bats. Bats will eat literally hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes per day. I am not joking. They come out at night when you're asleep and you wake up and they're back in their little house. All you have to do is provide them a little house. And then there's instructions on like the stuff to sprinkle that makes the bats smell that they should come there and live there. So... Um, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. And this is going to sound like an ad and I promise it's not. I just have this resource available to you. We started the live stream like this. So again, I'm sorry for weird salesiness that this sounds like, but you're going to go to batbnb.com, batbnb.com. 
you're going to buy a bat house. There's instructions and resources there to find the right one for you, to find the pheromones that will attract the bats that are native to your region so that it's super beneficial. Um, and you can also attract bats that like specifically like mosquitoes more than like grasshoppers, for example. Whereas I want bats that eat grasshoppers. That's what I need. I hate grasshoppers. Oh, they love <laughs> um, it here. And bats love them. Yeah. And then, so you're going to go to batbnb.com and you're going to buy a bat house. And again, this isn't sponsored, I promise. Oh, but it will be. But I promise it's not. But they did send me a discount code because I put bat houses in my client projects a lot. And it's just Yard Farmer Co. Yard Farmer CO, all caps. I don't know if it's, it's fine. Lowercase caps, I don't care. Put that in. And I think it's 15% off. Well, you should do that. And we're going to make a YouTube video because I have a bat house from them. And I want to attract the Utah native bat that specifically loves grasshoppers. And I forget the name of it right now, but I have a PDF that I just read about it on my computer. Awesome. <laughs> Rachel suggests that we call the podcast Dirt Nerd. I love it. <laughs> I have a playlist on my TikTok called Dirt Nerd mm -hmm. because it's just when I talk about soil health. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> All right. Uh, Make it sweets. Have you ever used dwarf carpet of stars as a ground cover there in 8B? Um, 8B sounds like it would probably be good for dwarf carpet of stars. I do use it, not often, because um, sometimes I can just find better native options since I believe it's just a more cultivated product. Um, however, yes, in, in desert places, we're talking Las Vegas, Arizona, like Mojave, Sonoran deserts and such, where a true ground cover is needed that's fairly tolerant to foot traffic because there's a pet or children or some, some such need, Dwarf Carpet of Stars is typically the material that we will end up going with because it is truly adapted to all of those conditions specifically. Um, but if there are not needs for pets or kids, I would much rather do more of sort of a Xeriscape style. I use that word very hesitantly because my designs don't look like what you would imagine Xeriscaping to be. It's not like two agave plants in a rock. It's a very <laughs> lush ecosystem of native plants, right? but I would do something that is not necessarily a lawn or a ground cover, but instead like a beautiful configuration of desert natives. Um, if you don't live in a true desert, there's probably just a better native adjacent ground cover that we could find for you besides dwarf cover of stars. Uh, TikTok just chimed in on TikTok. What? To let us know that uh, it's awesome that we've been going for 90 minutes. Have we been going for 90 Actually, minutes? Actually, we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes. Well, so, should we wrap um, it up? Or? We should probably wrap it up. <laughs> we'll, we'll, should we do a couple more questions? If there are questions to ask, I'm having a good time. What about okay. you, Lee? I'm doing great. Okay. I'm doing great. Okay, so here's some more questions on TikTok. I had snowdrops in an old house and thought that's what this was, but it never flowers. I think I went farther into the question thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, I definitely did. Looks like I missed a couple questions. Okay. Okay, this is that person. Divergent Hippie. Great, great name there. Yeah, sure. I have I this grass looking plant all over my yard. It has little bulbs and no flowers. Do you have any idea what it is? Onion grass. Onion grass. Okay. It's in super invasive and it doesn't even taste like onions. And I'm sorry. Uh, and if you're going to just sheet mulch and start over, solarize sheet mulch and start over if you, if you don't like it, or you can just learn to live with it. I don't think it's necessarily the worst thing in the world. It's fairly invasive. Um, if it's competing out things you would rather have instead, or if it's competing out native important plants, get rid of it. You've got to solarize, you've got to sheet mulch. If you've got kind of like lawn and concrete and, and you're okay with it, you could just kind of learn to live with it. It's everywhere here in Salt Lake. Onion grass is everywhere. Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Uh, oh my God, on uh, <laughs> TikTok said, y'all, we need bats and to solarize everything. <laughs> so, it's, it's That's the much, theme of this. The theme. We've been talking for 90 minutes and it's literally just like, get bats and solarize. Yep. But don't solarize everything. Don't oh, solarize your bats. Only... <laughs> <laughs> this just in, do okay. not solarize your bats. No, they will not like it. <laughs> uh, bats do not, they're nocturnally. Yeah. No. Um, yes, I understand. We've sort of sounded like a broken record, but I think it's just sort of like y'all, y'all are finding questions that are applicable to what we're talking about. Exactly. So the answers are bats and solarization. I would not solarize unless you truly have a widespread invasive issue. Otherwise we can just sheet mulch or, uh, chop and remove and, and add some compost and wood chips, stuff like that. Yep. John just said bat B&B makes some crazy cool bat houses. Don't they? Yep. All right, great question on YouTube. This person, Liz, 
Hi, Liz. Moved into a property with a soil saver composter that's half full. It hasn't been tended to for over four months. What should Liz do first to make sure that the compost is okay? Um, well, great. I would just check it out and see is, is there organic matter in it that isn't broken down? Does it have a nice earthy smell? If it smells like dirt, then it's dirt. It's compost. It's good to go. Um, if there is still organic matter in it and it seems like there's not a lot of um, like organic activity, microbial activity, that just nothing's breaking down or it's just sitting there, we need to kind of jumpstart that and get it moving and grooving. So moisture is usually the number one reason that compost isn't going. It's just too dry. So you're going to want to make sure that it's staying sufficiently damp. And then um, another thing that you want to do is make sure that there's really equal parts carbon to nitrogen. And again, this is a tricky one because the they look like they might be equal parts, but they're not actually. Because let's think about like the weight of a banana peel in your hand versus the same size of leaves in your hand. Those are not equal parts by volume. So if you put a banana peel in your compost, I need you to take one of these of the leaves and put the leaves in. Okay, that's why I have a big compost, um, like a bin next to my compost bin that's always just full of shredded drunk, <laughs> shredded, shredded junk. Drunks. It's a it was a Freudian slip. Mm -hmm. um, shredded junk mail, shredded uh, paper towel rolls, toilet paper rolls, shredded cardboard, wood chips dried leaves, dried grass clippings, all of those things can be carbon that you can set aside. And then whenever you're ready to compost, you can have the carbon on top. If you are still not seeing evidence of like microbial activity, you can actually, um, I would get some like native dirt or soil from like underneath a tree because trees have the best microbial activity in a general ecosystem. So get some native dirt and put that in there. It's like a sourdough starter for your compost, like that kind of vibe. Um, and you can, if all else fails, you can get some mycorrhizal fungi or like some bio mycorrhizal fungi needs a live root, but like bio live, like from down to earth fertilizers is just like a fertilizer with a lot of like alive stuff in there. And you could throw that into the compost as well. If you're doing all of those things, equal parts carbon to nitrogen, staying nice and moist, you're, it's being turned fairly often. So that's, you're going to want to start turning it. Um, and you've jump started the microbial activity. You will have, effective compost at some point. Amazing. All right, the bee's knees on TikTok, does using clover or moss as ground cover attract more creepy crawlers than others? Um, I'm assuming they mean like... Yes. Hmm. I mean, like, does it... So so this is an interesting question um, because yes, if you're growing eco-friendly things, you will have more critters mm -hmm. than if you have like a monoculture that is like a barren wasteland, right? So when we have Kentucky bluegrass and nothing else, there's very little for critters to eat and enjoy. And it's really, it's a, it's a wasteland. And that's why we desperately need more native plant habitats in yards. Um, so what I would strongly suggest is like, don't be freaked, but like the goal needs to be to be building like a resilient biodiverse ecosystem, because what's going to happen is you're going to have beneficial things that come in and manage the less beneficial things. And you're not going to see, um, like a pest problem so much as just like a healthy ecosystem with everything on the food chain from like large animals or like, you know, <laughs> microbes like fungi and bacteria and everything in between are going to be interacting. Um, it is sometimes in, in like a traditional landscaping, Western kind of mindset where lawns are not necessarily nature. It's just this decoration that we walk over to get into our house. It is a little bit, hard for some people to swallow that like things are meant to live there mm -hmm. out in nature if we're actually trying to make our landscapes work with nature. I love that. Erin on YouTube wants to know if she needs to compost coffee grounds before putting them in the yard or just spread them around. I have so many espresso pucks just hanging about. Well, so do I. Yeah. We might have the same espresso machine, Erin. I have the Breville Barista, if that's what you have, and I got espresso pucks for days. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I'm going to give you an answer because I know where you live in Utah, but I also need to give the, the, like the broad answer because I don't know if people live in places with different soil conditions. So in Utah, we have, um, like a soil alkalinity of like, it's like nine sometimes. Like, it's just the, like, she's basic. She's yeah. basic over here. Okay. So like, like the soil is just so alkaline coffee grounds, obviously extremely acidic. So in Utah, you can absolutely 
distribute coffee grounds directly in your soil if you don't feel like composting them because there's just absolutely no amount of acidic materials that we can put on our soil that's actually going to be harmful. It's literally our um, water in our irrigation systems is so alkaline from like all of the minerals and calcium and things that like we truly cannot escape the alkalinity. So yes, you can just put it straight in your garden. Personally, I compost mine because I have a little compost thing right out my back door and I fill up my little kitchen scraps every day, including my coffee grounds. And I just dump it in the compost and don't worry about it. Now to give the full answer to everyone who might be watching across various parts of the United States. And if you live in like the Pacific Northwest, you probably have acidic as heck soil. Compost your coffee grounds beforehand because we want to be putting like neutral, beautiful, delicious compost on your soil and not just like acid, you know? You got to apply the context of your situation. All right. Great question on TikTok. Can you put a drip system in a compost bin to increase the moisture? I've seen this before um, where they were actually growing edible mushrooms out of like compost. And so they were, it was basically half compost, half um, mushroom starter with like the um, like all of the carbon and the and the mycelial activity. And then they had literally a soaker hose putting a constant drip of moisture on it. So yes, you absolutely could do that. Uh, it would just be kind of a fun, like hacky thing that you would rig together yourself. I personally um, just have like my garden hose kind of nearby my compost. And if I notice that it's super hot and it's been 90 degrees and sunny for a week straight, I'll just spray it with the hose real quick. Yeah. Uh, question about moss. Is it actually an issue for tick nesting? This person feels like it might be a myth. I have not seen that issue. If you, if you, it's really, this is like a personal preference thing, right? Like if you are really afraid of ticks and if you live in a place where ticks are a big problem, you want to make decisions that will limit the number of ticks that you could possibly cross paths with. I don't have that fear here. Um, and, and I don't see moss being the primary like proliferator of ticks, whereas just like woodlands would be mm -hmm. significantly more so. Um, you know, and you know those woods need what? bat houses. Would the get to get the bats for the ticks? <laughs> yeah, I would strongly. Um, I I'll, like if you live in a place that can grow moss, grow moss. It absorbs CO two like nothing else in this world absorbs CO two. Like it is just so wonderful. Grow it. If unless I don't, I don't actually know about the ticks. So like I don't know. We if don't. you're truly afraid of ticks, make educated decisions based on your personal feelings and your reason. Yeah. And I know we need all the carbon sinks we can get, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we do. So Daryl, I don't know a lot about TikTok, but we've had six and a half thousand likes on this stream. That's done about better than any TikTok live I've ever That's done. That's fantastic. So thanks everybody for following. And yeah. we've had anywhere from 10 to 2 dozen people watching on YouTube pretty much the entire time. So awesome. thank you everybody there. And for folks watching, I've said this a couple times, but of course we have people coming in and out. If you are new to the stream and you feel like you missed something, this lives forever on YouTube, which as a yard farmer, just like it is everywhere else. And you can just check that out, like, subscribe, and you'll never miss a thing. I promise. <laughs> Lee, I love ya. <laughs> I'm Daryl here behind the camera helping me out is Lee. We are working together on all of our long form content that's on YouTube. I would really love if you are currently watching and have not liked and subscribed to us on YouTube. I'd really appreciate it if you did. It's a labor of love right now. We are working, you know, after hours with our other jobs, trying to make this happen on YouTube. Um, we just did a really great step-by-step -step tutorial on raised garden beds that are very, very affordable. I would love it if you could go check that out, especially if you are expanding or starting a garden this year. <sighs> Big it's deep breath. It's been a good time. It's been a good this time. This was really, really fun. I can't believe that we talked for like almost two hours. Just about. I think this is a good time to wrap it up yeah. since we've, we've actually answered all the questions, but we are committed to doing this weekly unless we have to fly to London for a Beyonce concert. I was just called out a little bit. <laughs> No, I'm flying to London for Beyonce. Lee's Beyonce. going to London to see Beyonce. Big fan. <laughs> we went to school together. so Just visiting an old friend. Just old pals. That's awesome. I, I shouldn't have called you out on that. <laughs> you maybe even want people to know. Uh, but regardless, yeah, up until like mid to late May, we're going to be doing this every Friday night. And we'll continue after I, we all get back from our respective yep. trips. Yeah, I have a couple trips in May. I got a bachelorette I got to go to in ye old Scottsdale. 
and uh, yeah, traveling around for some things. But whenever we are both in town, Lee and I, we will be right here on Friday night, drinking a little booze, answering questions, generally enjoying each other's company. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right. Good night and goodbye. <laughs>